Hey guys, welcome back to The Big Show. I'm here with this fantastic entrepreneur. He's a fantastic guy. He's the black farmer. It's gonna be good, let's go. So, Wilfred, the black farmer, tell us a little bit about you for the people that don't know just who this amazing man that looks like me when I'm 70 or 60 or however old you are, or 50, just the way you dress, I love it. Well, can I just say, <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be in your company because I don't think I often surround myself with men who dress like me, but you know, you're a bit of a snazzy dresser yourself. Oh, not as and good as you. Say, if I look at this there, that is a real nice sort of touch to the end of it. <laughs> So it's great to be on your show. I love it. Okay, so what, what is it you wanted to hear about well, me then? Just, just you know, I, I've done some research about you before we come on, and, and, and I know you've got a sort of a colourful history, and I just want you to, straight from Jamaica. Give you some background. Yeah. Okay, fine. So um, I, I was born in um, Jamaica, and I was born in a place called Clarendon, um, Frankfield. So if you went to the island yep. today, you'd see quite a lot of subsistence farmers working the land. Now, for those of you who know your history, in the 50s, in the 1950s, people like my parents had an opportunity to come to this country yep. where there was em employment. And we were yep. very much part of the Commonwealth and Britain was seen very much as, the, uh, so as a mother So the UK country. wanted to bring in. Wanted to bring in. And so one of the things actually I like to sort of remind people of is that, and sometimes they forget this, is that it is a very entrepreneurial thing to do, leaving your country yep. of origin, Absolutely. leaving everything you're familiar with behind you, to come to another country, not only to better your life, yeah. but to better the lives of, of your children. So anyone who's done that, you know, yeah. A, it's a big think, risk to them, isn't it? It's a big, big risk, and I think they need to be sort of celebrated. So all too often, we look at people who are foreign, uh, you know, e Eastern Europeans maybe yeah, yeah. at the moment, but you know, these people who had an immense courage to yeah, leave course. their country behind, to come here, to work and to graft, to graft. And so, I've always said that I've got the sort of entrepreneurial spirit very, very much in my sort of makeup because my parents really did that when they came so here. So did your parents start their own business when they no, came no, here? No, 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 no. So what happened in my case, my, my parents, um, they came to Birmingham yeah, and they settled in a place called Small Heath. Yeah. in Birmingham, and um, I don't know whether I'm allowed to swear on your podcast or not. Just gently, go Just for it. Just gently swear <laughs> it, but all I can say is the part of Birmingham that I was from is a bit of a shithole. <laughs> so uh, do apologise for the language, but there's no other word I could use to sort of yeah, describe yeah. it. And it's one of those classic sort of inner city areas um, yeah. where the accommodation is cheap. I can remember where I was brought up, we had um, Asians on one side of us and the Irish on the other. So, yep. you know, we were we were those people on society's dustbin heap who were sort of yep. rejected by the sort of the mainstream. And there were 11 of us in my family, so 11 of us brought up in this two up, two down terrace Amazing. house. So how, so, many, how many in your room? So there were three to a bed. So I could remember that there was, there was a double bed and me and my two brothers slept on a double bed. Then there was a camp bed. It was seriously cramped. And um, not only was it cramped, but, you know, we were really poor. Because when my parents came to this country, my father just, well, you know, he was a very educated man, in fact. But um, his qualifications didn't mean anything in this country. So he ended up working in a, in, in a factory. Yeah. And my mother had to work in a factory sometimes as well. So there was a lot of disappointment because... Um, the country they came to, which they felt was going to give them a lot of opportunities, suddenly find out actually you're on the bottom of the pile. Yeah, yeah. Not only on the bottom of the pile, but you know, no one really sort of respects you. So, and um, that was the sort of environment. So that, that was, was racism a big thing? Can well, it remember? is. I mean, I think that any 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 immigrant community would have had racism, whether you were Jewish, whether you were Irish, whether you were Asian, whether you were blacks. It's just something about human nature anytime something different comes in it always causes some sort of friction until the host community gets used to it but you know i was brought up in the days of enoch powell and all that sort of stuff so you know it was definitely do, do you still there. find that now or do you feel that we've got through that well i mean my view is this is that wherever there is difference and wherever people have um concerns about their lives the easiest thing in the world is to blame outsiders, to blame people who yeah. look a bit different. It's because and you work harder, though. And I've always said this. You see that, so one of my best friends is Jewish, and his 
granddad started a business, a very successful business in the United Kingdom, came over from scratch. Then his son took it over, so that's his dad. And then he offered it to him and he said, no, I don't want it. You see, I don't <laughs> actually think it's necessary being a different colour or being, being foreign. It's about having the attitude of yeah. the outsider. Yeah. It is outsiders who change the world. Yeah. Any new invention, yeah, 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 of course. any new thinking. It's somebody who says, actually, all of that's gone before is wrong. Yeah. My my new idea is the right thing to be. Now you have to have. You the don't have to keep up with the Jonases, do you? You exactly. can just go for it. Yeah. You have to have the outsider's mentality to even have the audacity to feel as though you're going to change the status quo. Yeah. People who are not entrepreneurs exist within the status quo. They don't want change. Yeah, yeah. This big massive Brexit debate. Yeah. It's fundamentally a debate between certainty and uncertainty. Yeah. People and politicians are promising people certainty. We as entrepreneurs have to live with uncertainty all yeah. the time. And you know, you started off from when you were a 15, 16 year old, all that time living with uncertainty. You're still here, yeah. you're still managing to put food on the table. Yeah. And it's, it's about getting people to understand there is no such thing as certainty. All you have to do is have the mindset to be able to live with uncertainty. If you have that mindset to live with uncertainty, yeah. you could do anything. Yeah. Absolutely. So anything. We, we, we call that get comfortable being uncomfortable. Exactly. And I call that uncertainty. <laughs> Make a friend of uncertainty yeah. rather than thinking it's the enemy, rather than panicking and frightened because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. That is where you have to have faith. So we've, let's just fast forward a little bit because I, I know that a conscious of time. Mm -hmm. So, so from Birmingham, when did you get your first job? What was your first? Okay, so what a happened? Bit of dough of your own. So you know, I was telling you that. So I was brought up in um, a terrace house, um, and we were poor. And so my father had an allotment, yeah. and it was my job as the oldest boy to look after this allotment. And what's is very important, I can remember the age of eleven. I remember making myself a promise that one day I would love to own my own farm. And that was for a number of reasons. I just loved being in an environment where, you know, you could breathe. You didn't have to always continuously look over your shoulder. You didn't have to worry about what people thought. And I just thought, actually, I like that feeling. And I want to try and get myself into positions so where I could have that feeling. Yeah. And one of the most important thing that you probably tell people is that you have to have the courage to dream. Yeah. The English are not very good, and they're quite cynical. When we well, talk about and, and you get dreams. put down. You Everyone get put, put down. Yeah, yeah. All these goddamn fear mongers. That's why people go over to America. Uh, exactly. Like, and you know, they think, who does he think he is, and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, that is a big you, problem in the you UK. Gotta have the, you have to have the courage to dream. And I can remember as an 11-year-old kid thinking, one day I'm going to have my own farm. I don't know how I'm going to get it but that is what I want to achieve. It took me 35 years to fulfill that dream. So I say to young people, dream early, boy, because you know, it takes so you a long time for it to, to achieve your dream. So it was 46 when you bought your farm? But you see, this guy's a mathematician. <laughs> so he's obviously very good at sums <laughs> around about that time. And um, so I went, in those days, they were called secondary moderns. I went to the local secondary modern yeah, school. Yeah. And that school was as much as... Did you do well at school? I was fucking awful. <laughs> I was one of those kids, I was, I'm dyslexic, and um, in those days people had no understanding of dyslexia. Yeah. And uh, not only, actually not only don't they, didn't they have any extended understanding of it then, but they really still don't have any understanding of it now. Yeah. And most of the people who go on to run their own businesses and become successful are dyslexic. Yeah, 35% of self-made millionaires in this are country are dyslexic. Dyslexic, and that's because you learn to think differently. Yep. So dyslexia is a gift. It's not a curse, it is a gift. And for anybody who feels that they're struggling with the, the common things like sums, reading and math, you yep. have a gift. And make sure you, you understand that it's a gift, it's not a curse. Anyhow, so I left school, 16, no qualifications at all. And um, I wanted to get away from home, so I joined the army, not because I wanted to be a military man. The UK army? The UK army. I thought you might have gone back to Jamaica. No, 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 <laughs> man. And there's one thing you do not do. If you've got an ounce of entrepreneurialism about you, you do not join the military service. Well, how long were you in the army for? I got fucking kicked out, man. 
<laughs> you got kicked out. Well, yeah, have, How long did I, you last? I have a dishonourable discharge to my name. They spent about a year trying to lick me into shape. But you know, the army and those uh, army and corporate environments are about actually abiding by the rules. Yeah. By going with the protocol. Yeah. They don't want some lippy black git challenging <laughs> all the time. If you're going to challenge, you're going to get so your head you kicked get, in. What for? Uh, what did you do? Just uh, loads of stuff. You know, and they used to batter the hell out of me. They said, we're going to try and break you, boy, to get you to sort of take orders and things. But obviously, there's something about my spirit that just cannot be contained. Did you learn anything from the army? No, I didn't. Well, what I learned, actually, is that I learned that I'm never, ever going to fit into structures like that. So it's really important that I went through that sort of lesson. So I never then spent my life trying to work for these big sort of companies because I knew I would never ever fit yeah, in so yeah. from a very very early age I realised I was an outsider and then also realising again that being an outsider is not a curse it is a gift yeah. because you see it differently so, so having been so, kicked out of the army disgraceful you know, so that like, taught you let, let me just go because I've done a bit of research on you yeah. that taught you that you didn't like big organisations yeah. and big structure mm. but then you went and worked for the BBC well I don't know how to do that which is <laughs> well it wasn't that simple because what happened you see is that once i got kicked out of the army in those days if you were a failure at everything the only thing then available to you was catering so all yeah. the thickos all the people in society's dustbin heap went into catering you'd never believe it now because it's a pretty no. sexy glamorous profession. Yeah, yeah. but back yeah, in the yeah. day it was a thickos and i was one of the thickos <laughs> And, you know, I didn't work in anywhere glamorous. I worked in something like a, you know, burger bar and all those sort of places. But the dream that I had to have my own farm was always there sort of nagging Still, at me. even when you were yeah. fantastic. Because, because the thing is, you know, you've got to have something to sort of focus on in your life. Otherwise, you could sort of drift. And so this is, the, this is how I got into the BBC. Now, so with that dream to buy my farm, I just thought, well, you're never going to do that fl flipping burgers, boy. You've got to try and get up the ladder so you could get earn money because in a traditionally in this country farms are handed down by three yep, generations yep, yep. but you know obviously that wasn't going to happen in my case and at the time there used to be a fantastic bbc program on called 40 minutes they used to make social documentaries and i said, love that um that that series i thought i said to all my family and friends i'm going to get a job in the bbc as the producer director and they looked at me says this guy is off the fucking rocket hey <laughs> He could hardly read and write. B television back then and still now is full of the Oxbridge brain. Yeah, type yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Especially the BBC. Oh yeah, they all think because you've got some degree, therefore you'll somehow have knowledge of it. But I remember something, and these are the principles in, in how I run my life. And for any of your um, viewers here, I say, look, you only need two things to succeed in life only two things it doesn't matter what color you are it doesn't matter what qualifications you have your education your gender all of the things that people tend to think stops them from achieving things it's nonsense you just need two things to achieve whatever you like to, to achieve success and any successful person will have these two things the first thing is ruthless ruthless focus yeah. An athlete, he gets up at four o'clock every morning, whether it's pissing down with rain, when it's icy, it's focused and focused and focused. That is very, very important. But the most important thing, and it's more important than anything, is that you have to have passion. Yeah. And what passion does, it defies reason. It defies logic. Yeah. It's like, it, all the hurdles, it just knocks yeah. it through. Yep, it yep. does not sort of see. And what I say to people, look, if you want to know what entrepreneurial is and what that feeling is, remember what it was like when you fell in love. Do you remember yeah, what it was yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You don't know what the fuck is going to happen next. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, but you just matter. go for it. You yeah. just go for it. You that's just right. go for it. That is what entrepreneurial is. And so what? if the last time you had that feeling was years ago, you're not living life, you're surviving, you're existing. That feeling is about you're propelling your way forward. And there's another Passion thing. gives you resilience, doesn't it? It gives you resilience. Yeah. And you know, people are searching for happiness. Actually, it's pretty simple about actually knowing when you're happy or not. Happiness is when you are on the course to for fulfilling your potential. People think happiness is a destination. It's not. The happiest you are is, for instance, you know, buying your first house and just going through all of getting it ready. That is the state of happiness. 
So happiness is when you're on the road to fulfill your potential. And that is the clue rather than somebody else is going to give you it or it comes from this mistakeful place. So, it's fulfilling so your potential. Are you a happy person? Oh, God, yeah. <coughs> and the thing That's about... That's some water. So let's make it through God, the interview. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing, the reason why I would say I'm a happy person is this, because there are certain choices you have to make in life. And part of being an entrepreneur and part of being a successful person is that you have to decide whether you want to be or belong. Yeah. A lot of people want to belong. And that's fine, belong, isn't it? If that's what you want. The problem with about belonging is that you play by the rules of the community, by the crowd. Now, let's say somebody happens to be gay and they know that their parents are going to really object. They have a choice. And that choice will be they either fulfill their parents' needs uh, to belong or to be, which means that might upset their parents, that is a gamble you always have to take in life. Yeah. And it's a bit like being an entrepreneur. You've either got to go out on your own, knowing that it might upset everybody else and everybody's going to be chucking bricks at you, everybody's going to be fine. Oh, you yeah. have the courage to be. And if you have the courage to be, you could then fulfill actually yeah. your authentic truth. Most people are not living yeah. their authentic truth. I, I've what I've learned though, Wilfred, I don't know how you feel about this, but I've learned as my career's progressed that some people have more strength than others. It's in their DNA that they can lead people, they can take on more stresses than most. But I think, and I, I, you know, I think I've met some great entrepreneurs <coughs> that can just deal with stuff that most people just cannot physically deal with. Do, what do you think about that? Well, the thing is, if you, if you take you, for example, there's an energy for life about you, okay? You're a what, 16 year old kid with an energy. Now, I believe that there is nothing unique about us. The difference is the mind switch. It's yeah, the a mindset. mind switch. It's yeah. a mindset that actually it is down to us. Other people tend to say, well, the reason I'm not happy is because of that boss. The reason I'm not happy in my relationship is because of, you know, the, my wife or my husband. They look outside of themselves yeah, right. as the reasons why they're not fulfilled. What we do yeah. is understand it's down to us. See, what, what I mean by this is, so for example, my fiance, Natalie, love her to bits. Like, she wouldn't borrow a million pounds to start yeah. a business. Like, she couldn't sleep enough. She just couldn't fathom that into her head. She can borrow half a million pounds. Whereas I'd do that, uh, women go, yep, next. And, and it don't why, even, yeah. it doesn't even, like, I've, I've forgotten about it once I signed a piece of paper. <coughs> Are you like that? Well, you see, what's really interesting, because one of the things, if I wasn't an entrepreneur, I'd be a psychologist. Yeah. And it'd be like, well, what is it about her background that has made, because that's fear driven. Yes, of course. That, yeah. that is massively fear. So what is it about her background that's made her fearful? And you probably look at parents and all that to find that this principle of fear is so ingrained that they sort of pass on the narrative. And then, so what happens is that that's one of the reasons why she's with you, really, it's because actually yeah. you're the sort of person that yeah, yeah. will just sort of go for it. And then, you know, what I'm interested in is that, well, the reason why you are an entrepreneur is that very early on, you would have realised that actually if anything's going to happen, you're yeah. going to have to make it happen. You Did can't, you, you can't, you, there's no one else to rely on, do you know what I mean? Oh, well, quite. so from a psychology point of view, well, yeah. do you think, so... I didn't particularly, you know, I left home very young, mm. I had nothing, so I went through it, I had nothing to lose. Do you think if you have a good upbringing, like a happy upbringing, a family that will always look after you if you get knocked down, via not having that, well, that, that can be a strength? Well, it's very interesting because my children are very privileged, you know, they're yeah. part of the fucking upper classes now. <laughs> my, my, son, my daughter went to Bloody Sherbourne, my son went to Branson, they went to the, you know, they are, yeah, yeah. They're, they're boarding school, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're the 2%. Yeah. And so it's really interesting because sometimes people say, well, to achieve things you've got to suffer in life. And I don't believe that. Yeah. And, and I don't think that I would wish my background on anybody because it's yeah. fucking hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the one thing that we need, whatever background you come from in life, is confidence. Confidence yeah. of self. Yeah, yeah. And if you have confident self, you know that whatever comes along, you're going to be okay. And did your parents put that in you? No, they didn't. I had to learn it. Because Fine. my parents would have been from a fearful background because they came from Jamaica all their dreams were dashed, they would, be, they would bunker down and fearful. So I would have had a choice as a child. I, would have, I could have decided to be like them yeah. or decided actually, I, just, I knew, I decided I do not want to be like this 
and I'm going to do everything I can to, yeah. to, to actually, you know, create my own world. And what about your kids? Have you put self-confidence in them? Well, yeah, so the way they're brought up and the environment that they could go into any situation and be confident. And therefore, that is the key thing in life, is to be confident that when things go wrong, you will be all right. That, you know, you don't, ex this, this, this thing about certainty that traps people, it's not necessary. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're happy with the fact that uncertainty um, is not an enemy, that life is uncertain, but they have a confidence that whatever life is, whatever gets thrown at them, they will be all right. And so that is the key thing about entrepreneurialism. Yeah, because course, we, yeah. from day to day, we do not know what's going to happen. You know, we have to live through the midnight hour when we don't know whether we're going to have enough money to pay this and all that. But, you know, there is just something about it will be all right. And I just think that is the key to try and get into it. Because lots and lots of people would love to be entrepreneurial and that fear, stops that them. fear really, really stops them. And that but, fear is, oh, what happens if I can't? And well, but, but business does go wrong, doesn't it? It but, does. You know, I mean, I was watching a Richard Branson interview the other day and he said, that, you know, the chances of businesses succeeding or not succeeding is as <coughs> close as sailing to the wind. Um, and I just... And he said that Virgin, for many, many years, like decades, only just about got through through the skin of his teeth. Now, obviously, the guy we all know now is a multi-billionaire, and I think we could say mm. that, that he's in a safe place in terms of the Virgin business. What about you? Let's go into your business now. You know, did it happen overnight? Was it yeah, difficult? It's a struggle. And I think what it is... Still? Uh, oh, yes, it is. I mean, I've been in business 15 years, and it is a struggle. And what happens, you see, and where a lot of people fail in business, and I've seen many people from very privileged backgrounds go into business and they fail, because what they think they need to do is bring all the structures of a corporate environment, like yeah. Roland Coots is here, bring all yeah, that yeah. into an entrepreneurial environment. You will die. Very quickly. Very, very quickly. Yeah. And so what, what, one of the things I find absolutely fascinating about um, entrepreneurialism. I'm really into this left left brain, right brain um, sort of debate. Yeah. And so um, left brain people are into reason, logic, what makes sense. Right brain is creative feelings and instinct. Yeah. Now, when you're entrepreneurial, you have to be able to rely a lot on your right brain. Of course, yeah. You've got to feel that, you know, yep. Yep. you know, rather than, I remember somebody, t I was listening to um, a story where somebody was saying he wanted to invest in um, someone's <laughs> business, 10,000 pounds or something it was, and that uh, he went to his solicitors to say, right, you know, yeah. how much would it be to draw it up? And they said the bill was going to be 10,000 pounds, over 10,000 pounds. So he just <laughs> rang him up and said, look, just send me an email and just say, look, you know, I've given you ten thousand pounds. When you when you can pay it back, you can pay it back. Now, yeah, that's what entrepreneurs. Yeah, about. that, that is trust. exactly what entrepreneurs it's do. About, yeah, it's about trust. It's yeah. all, you've got to be able to, you know, you come from a port, you call, Oh no, you've got to yeah. do this. All the fear <laughs> yeah, mongers, yeah. and they're all around you. They're the ones that yeah, are yeah, yeah. need you. But yeah. entrepreneur is that. You've got to go with your guts. You've got to, it's all about yeah, trust. Yeah, yeah. You've got to but build. Do, have, you, have you got any left, left mind thinking people around you, dude? No, but I do have a left minded thing as well. But what I'm trying to say, one of the great problems I would think that most people who go into business and they can't is because their left brain is takes over. Takes over. Yeah, I've got it. They want it all, you know, yeah. they want it all, you know, certainty, certainty. It's actually no, you know, it doesn't, you're going to have a degree of it, but, you know, yeah trust the right brain, your instinct. And yeah. it's, that is becoming more and more prominent in, in a, the society that we live in. Wilfred, there's a great saying, I just want to tell you this. If two people um, want to do business together, they mm. won't let details and paperwork exactly. get in the way. Yeah. If they don't want to do business together, they'll make sure the details exactly. stop it from happening. And that's pretty much what you... And exactly, and then what happens, the moment something gets the contract stage, yeah. the relationship's dead. Yeah, of course. That's, it's simple as that. Yeah, of course. So, you know, it's just these left brain, bloody biases, let's make an yeah, yeah, yeah. out of fear. Absolutely, yeah. Out of absolute fear. But when you're an entrepreneur starting up, you have to trust. And sometimes people will shit on you. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, things do. do go wrong. And my, my view is this. If you, if you haven't had failures, yeah. you are not living to your full strength. Course. I've had tons of failures. Yeah, I've of started lots of things that have not worked, but that is your test that you're living. If you could say, oh, no. if you're a perfectionist, 
if you've never made mistakes, you are not living. You're surviving. Of course, yeah. You're not living to your potential. Nip, I need to know about mm. the black farmer because okay, that's okay, the, okay. We're that's talking the about bit. everything. We're talking <laughs> psychology. I know. I know. I know could spend hours. With, no, but so, don't, take from BBC to black farmer, like because you <laughs> okay, had quite yes, a big job in the BBC, didn't you? So yeah. So what happened was that, and this is oh yeah, this is this. Every time you start me on a subject, I go off and go <laughs> yeah. around. But this is quite important for anybody who wants to be entrepreneurial. Is that, you know, deciding that I wanted to go into BBC by being focused and by being passionate, I then spent two and a half years, you know, ringing people, writing to people. They wouldn't take my calls. They wouldn't. What, in TV? In TV. To get a job. To get, nobody was interested. So I thought, right, if somebody said they were a security guard, I would go and help them lift the bloody, you know, that gate. Um, yeah, barrier, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing. If somebody was a cleaner, I would go and help them clean the offices at the BBC just so I could get in. Now, the other thing about being an entrepreneur is spotting your guardian angels. They're out there. Mate, this, but this, right, mm -hmm. this is why I wanted you on the show. What you're about to say now, I saw you speak this. Yeah. Listen to this, gang. This, yeah, that, this is the, the advice. This, 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 is is the, really, this is the golden nugget of this podcast. The, Go. The really, really important thing in life is finding your guardian angels because you will never, ever be successful on your own. Yeah. There will be people out there for some unknown reason that will put themselves on the line. They'll go out of their way to give you a break. And I'll tell you how it happened in my case. Um, I was invited into BBC Pepper Mill, <coughs> into a canteen, and someone um, introduced me to a guy called Jock Gallagher. This happened centuries ago, and I still remember his name. And he took me up to his office, and he said, look, you're not the sort of person we would employ in television because, you know, you don't have any education. You've got a bit of an attitude problem. <laughs> but he said, but I will take a chance with you. I'll just give you a job as a runner for three months and to see what happens. Now, that man giving me that break then started my long career in television. I would never, ever have got in through an application, you know, human resources would have just chucked it in the bin just so he doesn't fit the criteria. And every single stage of my development in my business, I could point out people who have gone out of their way to give me a break. And those are the people to spot it. Don't let your guardian angels go by whilst you're yeah. still pissing about yeah. thinking about it. Seize the opportunity because that helps you. Well, I, like, I, I get really cross when I hear entrepreneurs say they're self-made because you, you get help, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, people are opening doors for you. It's just whether you choose to accept them exactly. open doors. It's yeah. really, really important. And the idea that you're going to do it on your own is just, it's just it's absolutely crazy. Because, And also, you see, part of being successful entrepreneurs are people who know they can't do it. Yeah. I can't read and write. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I could rely on other people to do the things yeah. that I... I was, look, we have a crisis management system in our business. And it's working out. If I dropped dead tomorrow, the business would be able to run very, very effectively. Yeah. But there are four or five other key people. If they drop dead tomorrow, we'll be in the shit. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. it's my name. I'm yeah. the top man there. But in terms yeah, yeah. of the engine room of the business, yeah. they are the power. You know, I'm just a mouse, basically. And that's the important thing that we entrepreneurs need to remember. You know, it could function quite well without us. But, so, so do you just give me this whistle. So you become a runner at the BBC. Mm -hmm. and then... So a runner and then a researcher. Yeah. And then and then a producer. And so then you became I became a producer. Yeah. But at the know, BBC. No uh, no offense, a black guy in the what what decade? Oh in the eighties. So um So was, it, was that rare to see a Oh yes, I was the only black guy. You know, when I I did something called the BBC Graduate Training Scheme, so it's full of graduates. All of them were Oxford and Cambridge. And then so, you turn up. And then most of these guys are big names in television. Yeah. I turn up and they think, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and um, <laughs> But what, I, what I was good at was that I was a really good director. And yeah. those are the days when you, and my boss used to send me out. I traveled the world making food programs. Yeah. And, and just at the time, it was just at the start of that big celebrity chef culture. Yeah. And so my so boss <laughs> knew that chefs like Gordon Ramsay, you know, Anthony Ward Thompson, Brian Turner. So did you Jeff work with all those guys? Yeah, yeah. It was my job to break them in. So my boss knew these were... Those guys were like me. They're from, you know, they're tough guys who don't yeah. take any shit. So the Oxbridge types would find it yeah. difficult to manage these guys because they're the sort of guys yeah. who take you outside a sort of problem. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'd be happy to go outside and have a few <laughs> fish <laughs> just so yeah, they know that I'm good. the fucking yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they just know and so yeah. therefore, you know. So, so, so Gordon? Gordon uh, Ramsay, James Martin. So I can remember Gordon Ramsay coming to my house 
um, to cook Sunday lunch for me. Was it good? It was fucking brilliant. <laughs> and, and it was so we could practice what it's before we went out and shot, what to, how to be in front of the camera. Definitely. So this guy is a big fucking Hollywood geezer, but started off with only wow, here. Wow, my man, fantastic. You know? so, so you went from that. You know, and actually, you know, Gordon Ramsay had the, has a reputation of being tough. He was a nice guy, pussy cat compared to me. Uh, Fantastic. Real, uh, taskmaster. So, so, so f 15 years at the BBC. 15 years at the BBC. That's a long time, isn't well, it? Well, it is, you see, and this is what's really interesting about, you'd think that from my background, that actually you'd sort of think, right, settle boy, you're done, you're lucky to get the, got out of the shit heap to yeah, a nice yeah, job, yeah. you just stay there. But again, that dream that I had was always fueling me to go forward to achieve that. So I left the BBC, I can remember, with just enough money to pay my mortgage for three months and decided to set up my own food and drink marketing agency because I just thought, look, if I don't do this, I'll never really achieve my dream. And there is nothing that focuses your mind more ah. than only having enough money to pay the mortgage for three months. Because what people do is they surround their lives with what I call the white noise of living. Yeah. Most things don't actually matter. Yeah. really don't. And if you can strip that out, and focus on what matters, you find that you have the energy and the time to do the things that you want to achieve. So, it, so you went from employment to entrepreneur really quickly. Yeah, but I was a freelance. Even though I worked for the BBC, it wasn't a permanent job. It was also a freelance. It just happened to be in the BBC. But you, I mean, now you're a marketing agency. That's a proper, That's a pro proper yeah, going diving in, isn't it? Yeah. That's not doing a yeah. freelance job. I mean, that is responsibility stuff, it is, isn't but it? But again, you know, what happened at the time is that I met my wife, and again, another guardian angel, somebody who saw something in me and decided that you know she would stick by me and actually allow me to fly so how long have you been married been married now what 25 years wow. and so it's about finding people who will allow you to fly and not be there to protect them you know so, well, but so, so she came into the business with you did she into no, the... no, so, no, so what happened we started it together so, yeah. so when we started the um, marketing agency we started that together so she's obviously she has all the skills that I don't have you know so she's she's a real detailed person and um, so that's where she's quite Fact, I mean that, that that is what I so I str I love detail but I don't like implementing detail so yeah. I, I just harvest as much good detail people into the business which obviously mm. I think I always know good entrepreneurs mm. that that yeah, want bring the people in yeah, yeah. so I, I, this is my theory about running a good business you need two types of people to run a business you need a gentleman and a thug people don't like working for thugs they like working for gentlemen but people like to know there's a thug in the background yeah. in case something <laughs> needs to be sorted out. So, but I mean, I done some research into your marketing agent. I mean, that was no small thing. I mean, you had done had yeah. some big clients in like oh, kettle yeah. chips and exactly. So what happened again? You see, they're big clients now, but back in the day, there were nobody knew them. So kettle chips didn't exist. Lloyd Grossman didn't exist. Cobra beer didn't exist. And so what happened is that these guys came to us because we were cheap. <laughs> they had no money. <laughs> None of the big bloody agencies would touch what, them. What, what and did you do to... So what they wanted, and this is again about the power of being the outsider. Yeah. But the power of being the outsider is that you think differently. One of the clients we had, for example, was Plymouth Gin. And so Plymouth Gin is trying to you know, create some sort of awareness. And it just happened that at the time when we had them as clients, there was a big eclipse going on down in the southwest. It went there, you know, when it went day yeah. and night. And I said, right, Plymouth Gin is going to sponsor the eclipse, you know. And, pe and just having the sheer audacity to say, that is what we're going to do, that goes to show about the thinking the outside that means yeah. that you can actually have ideas that are just outside any corporate structure. Could you imagine? trying to come up with ideas and then you've got a board of people yeah. to having to decide. And so what, where we work well is where the business were driven by entrepreneurs, yeah. where somebody, one person would say yes or no. The, the biggest nightmare is when you've got to go through layers. They're really trying to predict what they boss may think yeah, they may yeah. like it's a fucking nightmare. So we never ever worked with people like that. they wouldn't have touched me because they would yeah. they took one look at me and they think, Oh God, this guy's an arsehole. We don't yeah, yeah, to, yeah. We don't yeah. Do with him. So it was the entrepreneurial types that went for, for me. And that's how we built our business and then that gave me the money to buy my farm. 
took me nearly 30 years from the day I was at... So, and that stopped now, the agency? You don't run that? No, I don't run that. So that basically, what we did is that we wound that down and then actually put all the efforts into um, running the Black Farmer. But why is the Black Farmer? This is the, this is the bit I want to get to because I'm sure some people know, but for those that don't... So the Black Farmer. So basically what I did is that I bought a farm down on the Devon Cornwall border. Yeah. And when I bought this farm, I thought, actually... There's a real interesting thing going here. There's a big gulf between um, rural and urban Britain. It's like as though there are two different nations. So yeah, um, I saw actually there's a real there's a real gap here um, in the market. And again, back to my idea about outsiders who bring about change. And I thought actually I'd been in food all of my career, whether there was a chef, whether working in food programs, whether it was marketing food. I thought actually what I want to do is create my own brand, my own food brand. And I wanted to create something that was a quintessentially English brand, British brand, and something that was slightly different. And I thought, well, what should I do? I thought, well, I'll do something that is very English, which is like a sausage. They all like the yeah. sausages. I looked at the sausage market, and at the time, most of the sausages were disgusting, the shit, because traditionally, what butchers used to do is put all the shit end of the pig into the skin and sell it to the sausage. That's yeah. what they did, spit all the place, and they were pretty disgusting and full of gristle. So I thought, I'm going to do a fantastic... Uh, really high quality sausage that was gluten free because again the way of actually making a cheap sausage is stuff it with sort of wheat because it's cheaper than actually protein so I do a great sausage and then I would um, it will be gluten free and then I try and sell it to the supermarkets and then the next thing was to come up with a brand name because a brand name is really really important and because I'm from a marketing background I know how important that it is yeah. and so I was scratching my head thinking what the hell am I going to call this brand and uh, one day it came to me all of my next door neighbours used to call me the Black Farmer and I thought shit boy you know this is a pretty good brand name not only is it a really good brand name but it has an edge to it yeah People are not too sure about whether it's politically correct or not, whether you yeah. can actually say <laughs> yeah. the yeah. black farmer. You know, in this country, there is this nervousness about what is the correct language to use yeah, when you're yeah. talking about sort of race. And what I remember, and a lot of your listeners probably won't actually un re um, understand this, but when Richard Branson launched the Virgin brand, saying the word virgin in public was very, very risky. Yeah. He, he just did not say uh, yeah. so the Virgin brand, just the name, was just breaking the mold. Yeah, of and course. And it was showing that actually you're totally challenging the status quo. And this is what they represent. So the whole model was based around what Richard Branson did with the Virgin brand. Create something which is slightly a bit, you know, different. Yeah. And then what does it then stand for? Because the key about launching a brand if you've got a great brand, people don't buy sausages, they don't yeah. buy my food products, they buy what you stand for. That is the key thing with any brand. That's why Richard Branson could go and do airplanes, records, yeah, of course. what they're buying into is a potential, the yeah. philosophy of that brand, of course, of course. what you stand for. So the Black Farmer brand is all about quality. It's about quintessentially British. We will never, ever, you'll never find any foreign bloody meat in, in our products. It'll always be British. It will be, it's a, you, the principles of your brand in everything that you do, you follow it through. It's a maverick brand in terms of how it behaves. If you see our advertising. Oh, well, Matt, I love the little dancey thing with you. Yeah, Mate, Charles, can we put that at the end, if we put it onto YouTube at the end? Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah, could, yeah. Right. yeah well, cause it's so good, like, just so people get it. We'll put that in at the yeah, end. Yeah, put that in there because that, that again, it shows it. So a good brand, everything that you stand for, it's reflected in everything that you do, whether that's the food. So we know what we can, the most important thing with a brand is to know what you can't do. Yeah. So the Black Farm is quite a masculine brand. So you could never have Black Farmer cakes, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, what the fuck is all this, you know? Yeah, yeah, they, they yeah. would then start feeling like a con. And so therefore you've got to know what and, you stand and how for. And how many years have you been doing the Black Farmer? So the Black Farmer is now about 14 years. And the other thing about running a business is this, it, it, you know, some of these big brands that you're now here doing so well, it, they take 15, 16, 17 years before they're suddenly yeah. discovered. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, so True people story. Think, people think that it's overnight. It's a fucking slug for yeah. 18 years. And suddenly, oh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, you, you're in the 6% club. Do you know what that is? No. So 50% of businesses have gone within two years, 80% within five years, 94% mm -hmm. are gone within 10 years. All right. So you've made it through to the... 
exactly. the top six percent. And not only that, but I still own a hundred percent of my business. Fantastic. And that is the then the important thing. The way to do that is everything is mortgaged up to the hill. <laughs> Every fucking bit of money, because the moment the money men get involved, it's a you, it's a different proposition. Yeah, you're not happy, are you? Well, it's, well, it's a different proposition. Yeah. These fuckers want their money back fast, and then they give a shit about your bloody so, marketing philosophy and all that. We well, want our money back. But talking about the black, so 14 years, like, what did what it sounds like now? Do you mind? Like, are you yeah, selling so we to? Do, so we would be what about 15 million pound brand. And so what would happen is that we've been through many ships. So one of the things that we've had to do is continuously adapt. So one of the things I made sure we never did was just to focus on sausages, because actually the trend for eating pork and sausages is going down. Yeah. So, you know, if, if all we were was a sausage brand, we wouldn't be in, in, around yeah, of in course. another 10, 15 years. So what we've done is that we've stretched out into chicken. Yeah, we do, which um, is massive, isn't it? It's chicken massive. So. Um, so we do chicken, we do pork, tea, coffee cheeses, eggs, so anything which is food. Oh, and where do you sell online? No, 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 no. So we're in all the retailers. So we're in Sainsbury's, we're in Tesco's, we're in Morrison's, we're in Asda. We're and in who's, your, who's your biggest customer? It's Sainsbury's would be our biggest customer. See, I'm going to look now. Oh, yeah, so we, we have our sausages in Sainsbury's. A cardo will have a, um, a full range. And, and you make, do these guys screw you down on margin? Yeah, I mean... I think, <laughs> Well, I, they do. I mean, <laughs> That's the end of it. Yep. Well, I think what's, what I find absolutely interesting about the environment that we're in, entrepreneurialism also, it's about catching the zeitgeist. Do you know yeah. what that means? So catching the zeitgeist is um, recognizing a trend before a trend happens. Yes, Like yes. at the moment, veganism is a yep. bit of a trend. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, you, it can either be a trend or a spike. Sometimes you have a spike, they go up and they come down, they die yeah. again. Now, catching a tr um, um, catching the Zide guys is something that is going to be continuously big. Now, what has happened, I think, is that over and if you if you look at what's happening in the high street, if you look at some of the big brands that are now you know that are now dying, losing money, um, because of the internet revolution, is that consumers are now moving away from. What they, I call commoditization, corporatization, yep. to relationships with individuals. Absolutely, okay? they are, yeah. People will like you because you are a personality. Uh, you yeah. are a person. You know, everything that I do with my brand is that they're connecting with me. Yeah. People are far more interesting to have a relationship with a per somebody. They could see that you're involved in it yeah. than a faceless sort of corporate. So, so how are you helping? So, like by doing stuff like this, yeah. you will pick up some customers, won't you? Exactly. So, how you know? It's back to my great philosophy. And what you'll find with entrepreneurs, they are the people who are very willing to support and help you nurture people because they know how fucking hard it is. Yeah. And they know that actually, if it wasn't for other people, they wouldn't yeah. have been. You know, they wouldn't start. So, I try and do a lot of sort of nurturing, and I run something called the Hatchery where I'll get brands, people who want a brand, and I will develop that brand, and I will help them, you know, for it to sort of um, grow. So I'm really interested in it. But what I look for is that I'm looking for the person behind the brand, because I believe it's about the person forming the... Like, you run a number of businesses. Yeah. Those businesses would mean nothing if it wasn't for your personality. Yeah. That is what gives I it get that. Well, no, I get that with the Black Farmer. So yeah. we're, what's the next stage of the Black Farmer? Do you want to grow it? Keep well, it, sell it. No, 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 no one is that. My next stage is this: is my, my, if there's one regret that I have is that I never had my own retail space because, to a certain extent, I'm limited by what the big major retailers will not will, will let me do. So my next stage is to have my own um, restaurant, you know, deli type stuff where people could actually go and they have the black farmer experience. Yeah. That is my next but big can you Can you buy your products online direct? No. So you can buy tea and coffee, because the big thing about food is distribution. Remember, you know, sausages, you've got a five day shelf life, mm. and it's a killer. And that's why the big corporates dominate the industry. You know, there are only about three big pork manufacturers in this country, and that's why, you know, pork might be bred in Lady Devon, having to be shipped all the way to Scotland to be slaughtered because of the way that we've um, you know, concentrated our sort of food chain. So, so at the farm, yeah. who's, how many have you got working on the farm? So like on my farm, so we do cattle on my farm. So it's a, it, and it's a pretty easy, a lot of people think farming is difficult. So 
what we so I don't rear any cattle. So what I would do is that I would buy cattle in when they're about six months old, and then they call it fattening up. So yep, what, yep. so, so with with um, beef cattle, it has to be it cannot go into the human food chain if it's older than two years. And so what would happen is that I would fatten it up and then I would sell it, in my case, to the local butchers. So they, um, you know, if you went down to Launceston and you wanted black, black farmer um, beef, you'd be able to buy it there. We don't have, you know, we don't have enough in terms of supply supermarkets because you're talking about, you know, bags so, and bags. So where are you, do you make your sausages in? No, so my sausages are not made on my farm at all. So my business model is this, is it's a white label model. So we, I don't make anything. So all of the products that you, you buy at the Black Farm are not made by me. I will find a manufacturer who specializes in a particular area, so sausages. I will then develop a recipe and then yeah. I will then come up Got with it. a spec, and I will say, right, this is the spec, and the spec would be, right, it has to be um, pork from this part of the pig, it has to be from British pork, yeah. and then we will then develop the, the, the seasoning and all that, and then that becomes our, that's why when you taste black farmer sausages, they're very different to everybody so, else, so it's our recipe. So do you, do you and make so like, like our eggs, for example, people say, well, aren't eggs, eggs, and they're not. So if you have a black farmer egg, it'll be the darkest yolk on the market. And that's because what we would specify is that that chicken is fed uh, marigold, so we have a nice quality, good egg. So that's the sort of stuff. Anything, any black farmer product has to be different to anything that's out there, because otherwise, why buy it? So what are you doing for the business? Like, what, what do you see your day-to-day -day role? My to job, my, what I say to people, every day I spend on the farm, I'm not doing my job. My job is to go out and shout about the brand. So, no, have you got, can you get yourself into like Harrods, Selfridges, you know, well, you want again, to do that? Well, the, but the problem with that, so because we are now mainstream, the likes of Harrods and Selfridges wouldn't no, touch yeah, it, no. you know, because they're, they're small and special. So part of the decisions you've got to make when you're in the food business is that, you know, the independents are not going to want to sell something that could be bought in the supermarkets because they're in competition with those. And so that's, if you're going down the supermarket route, that's high volume, low margin business. Yeah. It's totally different if you're going into the specialist then. So like, when you've, you say you're going into a carder, how do you make that happen? Well, I mean, I remember when we first started trying to sell our products into the supermarket. They're, they're not interested. Supermarkets don't like dealing with small people. They're like yeah. big guys. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. Their but one thing I recognized, so when I went, they all said no. So I thought, right, I'm going to go on the road and do massive road shows and do a big sampling program. And when I started at my business, it was just at the start of the big internet revolution. So Facebook had just started. Twitter didn't exist. Instagram didn't exist. All of the social media we now take for granted did not exist, but they were just starting to come about. Traditionally, if you wanted to get through to the consumer, you have to have advertising yeah. as it go through the newspapers and all that sort of stuff. But with the internet revolution, it meant you'd be able to talk directly to the consumer. So what I did is that I did sampling and people loved the product. I said, just do me a favor, because on my website, I put all the names of the, all the buyers and their telephone numbers. And I said, just write to the buyer and tell them why aren't they listing this product. And as God is my witness, that's how I got my listings. The buyers hated it because, you know, and because I knew that the only people the supermarkets fear Wait, are their customers. Let me customers. just say that again. So you told your customers... To write to the supermarkets. Oh, that, is, that is entrepreneurial genius. Well, it is. You see, now we wouldn't get away with it. it will, so what happens, like, the big corporate guys could never get away with it because, you know, the supermarkets... If you're doing something like, you know, £50 million worth of business with the big retailers, you, pr you pull a stunt like that. You know, like, well, fuck you, they, they <laughs> yeah. will pull the business, you know, they, they're, they're pretty brutal. So yeah. that's why you can't behave like corporate when you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. As an entrepreneur and as a small business, you could get away with that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, I mean, you say, yeah. it's better to say sorry than ask for permission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, what, that's why I say with entrepreneurs, you've got to think like yeah. a small guy. Yeah. Don't think like you're a big guy. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've been to see all the big name bosses of all the big retailers because I was a fucking pain in the ass. You know, oh, I, I love this. All, you know, I'd be, I'd be called up in their office and I'd say, look, you know, you can't do this. Where is it? But you can't. I said, well, you've got nothing to goddamn lose. So you might as well say it as it is rather than, you know, 
play a game that actually you're going to lose anyhow. So, so what now? The team consists of you and then some marketing support? Yeah, so there's about, so my team, very, very tight, so about six of us. So because running a fifteen million pound business, man, because most of the work you see. If, if well, you're no, well just, before you fast forward onto that, you got a fifteen million pound business run yeah. by six people. Yeah, that to me is very very rare. I mean, our well, it isn't. You see, but if you take it, take white label businesses like uh, if you take like Innocent would have been one or Fever Tree. If you're outsource, yeah, which is what we do fundamentally. So you have a manufacturer that manufactures. Yeah, it, I get that. And then you have dis- and they distribute it to the to the retailer. So, all we have is people who put the orders into the manufacturers, make sure. So my team consists of what they call supply chain. Yeah. And customer, our big investment is within our customer relationship. That yeah, is mega that. important to us. So that is fundamentally what we sort of uh, do. And and what what's your biggest challenge in the business? Cash flowing it or still? Cash flowing it all is a major challenge. And then at the moment, um, in this own label dominated age that we're in, that what what the retailers do. If if you own the space, pe- people people don't have choice really. I mean, one of the things I say to people is this: Why is it we have a hundred different varieties of apples in this country, but actually you can only buy four? Because what has happened is that the the big guys what they do is that they strip out and commoditize everything. Because what a manufacturer wants to do every morning is switch on the machine and have the same thing running through yeah. and switch it up at night. If you've got to switch it over for another thing, you know, they, they don't want to do that. So that's why what you see is this massive commoditization. But there's a reaction to that. That's why people wanting to now start, you know, independence. And that's why one of my strategies for my business is to have my own retail space. Because people, if you could buy... In London? Your, huh? in, in London? In London, yes. Because if you could now buy things online... When you go out and shopping, it needs to be a leisure experience. You know, yeah, of course, yeah, really yeah, 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 absolutely, some, yeah. Some, 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 some sort of fun with it, really. So, didn't we just, so with the cash flow of the business, is it because you've grown so fast? No, we've grown very, very slowly. So, one of the, one of the handicaps of owning your own business is that you're always struggling for cash flows. Yeah. And banks are fuckers. And in, all the money men, they're, they're all shits, basically. <laughs> They love you when you've got shitloads of money, but nobody's there when you, when you actually but, need but it. But what, what causes it now? Is it because you get delayed to pay or because margins are slim or a mixture <coughs> of both? Well, you've got slim margins, you know. It's just, it, it's, it's tough. I yeah. mean, it, 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 it's really, really, really tough. And that what I say is that it's to try and be in the place where you're in charge of your own destiny. You know, for example, the retailers will decide at Christmas, actually, will take your product out and put our products in because what they want to oh. do is sell their products. So yeah, I get that. You yeah. Say if you're in an environment where somebody's determining whether you will sell or not, you know, that's not a good place to be. Well, for, I mean, I literally could spend hours with you. Well, it's been fantastic. I've Talking really to. enjoyed and I, I want to... I want like off camera. I want to get to know you more because yeah. I want to. I want to get you to come to some events that I speak at. I just love. There's so many. Uh, I just wish we had time to delve into the. Maybe no, we'll do a part two in the future. No, I'd love to. I'd love to. Anything. Any, marketing, building brands is yeah. my passion. I'm going to send you a copy of my new book, Getting Customers, because yeah. there's stuff in there where we've purposefully tried to forget social media and talk about offline stuff to drive online, yeah. which I think is a thing people are not doing right now like so we're doing offline stuff like you're doing offline stuff <coughs> to get people online like you go and speak at like this place and you know there's 200 people in the room you know you made me a fan you've made me a, i'm going to buy your sausages now but the problem you have is is this and this is where we've got to try and get the model is that there's a certain cost for shopping online yeah people are not going to spend 25 quid which no. makes it economical just buying sausages yeah of so course that's why you need to have you know the, the big thing at the moment actually is about how to get people to subscribe subscribing is a big thing yeah so you see any of these big trends is that how do we get them to subscribe now you subscribe when you have loyalty when you have a fan base when yeah. you have a belief system yeah of course that's yeah. what it's about how can people find out about the black fuck Fa- youtube no. All you've got to do is theblackfarmer.com and then you'll find everything you need to know about that. And There's only go, one of you, isn't and, there? And then also, I've got a special offer at the moment. Yeah, so go on. Sell my for... coffees and teas. So go on if you've, if you've actually see, um, heard this um, 
podcast and I got something like a 50% off deal on yeah. my coffees and teas at the moment. So go and have a look. Let's get some of his coffees and teas. We're going to get some and we'll put them on. Yeah. We'll top and tail it at the end of the video. Okay. Listen, well, thank you very I much. I love you. And Literally, mate. I, you're just, I you mwah, thank just you a fantastic man and yeah. he dresses brilliantly, which I just wanted to point out. Um, check them out and please buy their sausages whenever you see them in the supermarkets. Um, okay. Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, Thank what you very a much. man. Thank you. See you very oh, soon. Yeah. Bye bye. I am the beat. I am black, red, white, and blue. I'm an Englishman. I am the earth. I am a rock. I am the universe. I am the beat. Trees, I'm the roots, I'm the aura of herbs. I am the beat. I'm flavors without frontiers, I'm free from, I am taste, I'm a smile at the end of a bad day. I am the beat. I'm a table set for a feast. I'm the summer breeze. I'm the winter chill. I'm the newborn child. I'm the echo of childhood. I'm a dreamer. I'm a blackbird. I will make the sky roar. I'm a black cat with a white tail. I am the beat. I'm the dance of fools and beasts. I'm the chance every man, woman, and child deserves. I am freedom. And I am one brilliant day. I'm a survivor and I am what and who I am. I never walk in circles when I can walk in a straight line. I am love, I'm a father, I'm the flame of my forefathers and all those that became for me. I am the black farmer. And this is my soul. <laughs>